Hey there! This is Scary Kitties, and I'm going to be making a developer's commentary for Tribal Breeze. Now, this game was co authored between myself and Tiki. Tiki actually made the original game, and then he was requesting beta testers. So I came along and I offered a beta test, and after doing a little bit of testing, I went ahead and took the initiative to add some things to the game, like just some suggestions. I was pretty new to using DrawMid, the Thief 2 level editor at the time, but I managed to make a few simple additions like patrol points, I changed the way they worked a bit, I added some functionality for the AI, like they would turn around at certain points during the patrols or at certain triggers they would walk to a certain place or do something, it just added a little bit more life to it. And those were kind of just suggestions, but he was impressed enough that he wanted to pull me on as a co-author. <laughs> well, once he did that, I went ahead and kind of took over in a way. There's kind of a famous switch in the middle of this mission, you'll see it. And that's the point where I started building. All this that you see right now was built by Tiki, including these little secret areas like this. He, uh, he was big on these little secret areas, and I guess that kind of inspired me in a lot of the things that I've done since. He also made all the writings for this area. Well, I made all of them for the area that I was in. Now, you may have noticed at the beginning of this that there was a check mark for the objective of don't kill anyone, which is kind of strange. Well, it's because both of us were completely new to coding and objectives and all that stuff at the time. Technically, it should be so that it's unchecked and then it becomes checked later on once something happens or rather gets X'd out if you if you fail that objective like it is in the official missions. But uh, I didn't touch any of the objectives whatsoever. I was kind of afraid to because I didn't know what I was doing. So I basically only did some building and some simple pseudo scripting and stuff like that. He handled all the objectives and all that stuff. That's why things are kind of confusing and all over the place because I really just didn't know what to do. So in a, in a way, th my... It, uh, fear of taking the reins kind of assisted in there being this mystery and this big twist simply because he didn't know what I was doing what I was going to do with the twist and I didn't know how to hint at the twist and I really want to change what he'd done so it just kind of comes completely out of the blue so see this little sequence here where she picks out the book and then she turns and she puts the book somewhere else that was one of the things that I'd added. Otherwise, she would just walk through in a constant loop between the rooms. Maybe there were some pauses here and there. I don't remember exactly. Now, you may notice that this whole building and the, the house here looks a little strange for a thief mission. Well, if I understand correctly, Tiki was trying to do kind of a modern thing. Like, it was supposed to not be in medieval times, but it was supposed to be kind of be today. We just didn't know how to make any modern looking resources and in the end it looks a little strange because the thief 2 engine just really doesn't do so well for modern settings at least not with stock resources maybe if we had completely new resources or maybe if we pulled some things over from system shock 2 or something maybe it worked then but as it stands it's a, it's a little it's a little odd keep away from the guard because if you get seen you will instantly lose as happens a couple times during this pre-recorded playthrough that I'm now doing my commentary over. Annoyed. Now, he did some planning of characters and such, like these characters mostly have names. I don't recall offhand who's supposed to be whom, but at the time I did a little bit of pseudo scripting so that they kind of acted out their parts a bit. This guy he isn't Benny, He's his name is um, Odin or something like that, if I recall. And there are some characters later on in the game, though, that go to certain places or do certain things based on readables. Now, some of that stuff was cut out because I think I had a kind of elaborate sequence, but it stopped working at some point during the playtesting, so it just got cut out entirely. Oh, well. That's how it works sometimes. Now, I really like the way that... He did have all these little secret areas, as I mentioned, that really inspired me. But 
One downside though was just that so many of these secret areas are necessary. You have to find them in order to continue on. And I think that some people found that kind of frustrating. Especially since you're walking across very close quarters with a lot of AI that could very easily find you and kill you. Now here I'm kind of exploring a bit. It's been a long time since I played this game, so I was kind of learning the ropes when I played this as much as anyone else who played this for the first time, although I had a little bit of memory on my side to help. Now there's, there's really not a lot I can say about how this area was made because, as I said, I had very little hand in it. I just assisted with a little bit of scripting here and there. So instead I'm going to kind of explain more of my interaction with the level itself. Now during the time of this, it happened, oh, it was probably three years ago at this point, I believe, maybe four. Yeah, I, I believe it was f four summers ago. Uh, I was, at the time, in my first full-time job. I was, I believe, 20 at the time. And I... I'm playing around here with what can be done with these hammers and stuff. I'm pretty sure that we didn't test for this kind of thing. And I'm not sure if you could completely kill him or not. I don't manage to. But it's, it's likely that if you, if you did, you'd just lose anyway. So that's what happens to me here in just a moment. As, as I'm trying to... Oh, yeah. See, I, I kill her right there. And then I lose. You get the don't alert it, anyone checked off as failed. Anyway, so all those summers ago, at the time I was away from home, I was at a camp that was kind of a place to, for people to get into employment, just a place where you kind of get some really What's poor pay and it was kind of crappy. But all I really had to do, because I was bored aside from work, all I really had was my laptop, and I had a kind of a weak internet connection. So although I'd initially planned to just do some gaming, I pulled up Dramid and started up with this kind of thing once Tiki pulled me on. Now, at the time, I was mostly just getting up every day, going to a local campground, cleaning up bathrooms, and then cleaning up cabins and then doing a little bit of maintenance work and then I'd come back and work on this some more. This is basically my life for about three months. And I'm not sure if that necessarily reflects anything except for just how I, w I had my job working so much with nature or working with people who were in uh, trying to get a vacation, trying to go camping. And it always kind of bothered me how people would try to go camping and yet they take their RVs along and all this fancy stuff and it just seemed ironic so because to me camping is always in a tent it's just weird to bring your house along with you and maybe some of that is reflected in what happens when I get to my twist which you will see after a while I'll explain a little bit more of it then now this little secret area that I just walked up here I'm, I'm just noticing some misaligned textures there but that little secret area there with, with all this furniture that moves. That's probably one of my very first additions to this mission, actually. It probably looks a little phoned in, and, and you may have noticed when I was walking through there that there's kind of some strange stuff going on with the walls and the ceiling. It's because I just couldn't decide how the texture should transition between the upper floor and the bottom floor, so it was kind of a clumsy little ending of one texture and beginning of another. I just really didn't know what to do and I'm still not quite sure if I really would know what to do in that case. This is a, right here is a little cut because as I was doing the t the playing recording for this, I uh, <laughs> kind of forgot about this area until later. So I'm just doing a quick cut back to here so you know what would happen if I just went through that door instead of silly, silly assuming that it was locked and just turning around and leaving. Oh well, that's how it goes sometimes. Now, I know that some people have called this one of the hardest missions they've ever played. I'm not sure how accurate that is exactly. Uh, I, I do know that it's probably tough just because of how much stuff you have to do without being seen or heard. And all, all these tight spaces and a lot of tile and noise. And I'm sure that's kind of frustrating. 
but I can't say that I've played a lot of fan missions myself, so I don't know objectively how difficult it is. I didn't find too much trouble when I was playing it here, simply because I guess I knew where everything was for the most part. You see I'm picking up some side coins and things like that, or searching little areas where I think there may be something, or I think I remember something was. Now this isn't going to be a full 100% loot run or anything like that, because I've... Well, I don't really know where absolutely everything is. I believe that I actually get all the loot in the house here, though. But once I get over to the area that I built, ironically, I find very, very little. But that's fine, because it's, it's enough to fulfill the objective anyway, so it's all good. Now, I know that in my later FM, Lingering Whispers, which is really the first <laughs> FM I've ever made all by myself, clear through from beginning to end. This one I still call not really my first FM, just because all I did was build some geometry. But in that one, I do a bit of coin hunt or coin hunting, coin hiding, whatever. I do a bit of that stuff, and I suppose that was kind of inspired, un intentionally or not, by what I saw here with what Tiki had done with some of this loot. I, I see there's, there's a lot of crates stacked around here, which probably could be used to jam up those AI, but... We never really tested for that, so I'm not sure if it's possible or not, or what can all be done. I know that after you've been to my area, I've, I've heard that, and well, I know in my area you get a sword, you get a blackjack and some other weaponry, because I, at the time of playtesting, I wasn't completely aware that Tiki meant this to be a modern mission, or maybe I was aware, but I just didn't really care that much. So, my area is much more set in a thief e universe kind of time, sort of, kind of. So you get thief-style weapons, and I've heard that you can come back here and use the blackjack to knock out the people who are around here, like these AI. But in my playtesting here, I tried that, and that didn't really work. So, maybe it's just a random sometimes, sometimes not kind of thing, I don't know. It's always interesting to go back and look at these areas that I haven't seen in such a long time. Because, well, at, at, when you're building it, everything kind of seems very imposing. You're not quite sure where everything will go when you're working on it, at least not personally. Maybe Tiki had more of a vision in mind than I ever did. But uh, it's, it's always tough, at least for me, to tell where things are going to go, especially when there is no grand plan in mind. Sometimes, as with the case of what I built in this... Uh, there, there's that transition point again. As with what I built in this mission, it's more a matter of just putting down areas and seeing that if they look good or not, and then moving on, and then if you're lucky, by the end of it all, you'll have something in mind for what you can actually do with it. I know that some FM authors do it that way, and some prefer to do it a little bit more organized. I guess it's just to each to the to each their own. Now this little area here, I've got a little bit of scripting in here where the servant comes in and turns on the light, which you'll see in just a moment. Now that was one of, another one of the things that I added. The AI scripting can be a little tricky at times, but sometimes it can be very satisfying to do something that really feels like it worked out really well and that it makes a lot of sense. Especially since you have to kind of do pseudo scripting, so sometimes you're playing with it and almost tricking the game into seeming to do what it really can't do. Like in this case, when the AI walks by, it looks like she flips off the light. But in reality, what she's doing, she's pushing a button, which in turn is connected to the light switch. So that guarantees that you can't flip the light from off to on, and then she'll turn it on when she leaves and turn it off when she enters. Otherwise, you could reverse it on her like that, but instead when she enters, she turns the light off and then turns it on. That guarantees that it's always going to be on when she enters. And then when she, when she leaves, then she turns it on and then off again. Did I, did I say that in reverse? Whatever. When she comes in, she turns it on. When she leaves, she turns it off. And to the player, it just looks like she's using the switch, and that's kind of part of the trick of it. Here I just turn it off on her, and she she doesn't know. It's difficult to really program in AI realizations and things like that. And in a lot of ways, while it may seem like a good idea in theory, 
it really isn't that great if you actually try it. There's a lot about Thief that's really, well, unrealistic, of course, but some of those things would be a lot more difficult if they were realistic, almost to the point of not being so much fun anymore. In some ways, the stupidity of the AI makes it a little more fun. Now, you've noticed by now, I'm sure, that there's some nice sunlight in this mission. Tiki set all that up, I'm guessing he based it off of some other fan mission or ask someone. But I really don't know how exactly that's done. I know that there are some settings in Dromed that will allow you to have that. Basically it just turns all the sky areas into a light. So there's a solid light from all sky areas and that's how it works. And then you can decide where the direction is coming from and where it goes and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of ironic here that he writes in a mention for Benny when the guy downstairs who sounds like Benny and who you'd think would be Benny has a completely different name. In some ways he's got kind of a story going on here, but to be honest I never understood it so well. You'd have to ask him what exactly he had in mind for all this. Now, some you can see some of the issues with our building here with like certain doors the way they turn like in that case that unless it, he was in t intentionally trying to trick the player or something that door probably would have been best rotating a different direction because otherwise as was the case there and it has been the case before you can kind of close yourself in by opening the door which could be kind of a puzzle or could just be kind of weak design <laughs> it's kind of debatable i suppose now here you see these big big wooden things with the grates on them. That, those are supposed to be speakers, I take it. And this is like a little concert hall or something. And so that just, again, is part of how he wanted it to be kind of modern in appearance. But it's really tough to do when everything has this Victorian oak look to it with all the, with all the doors and some of the benches and all that kind of stuff. Also, it's just difficult to make things look well unless you just go wild with the trim. Because while in real life you can have a nice white wall and it looks great, in here with those blocky lighting effects and all that stuff, it just is difficult. And it just doesn't look all that great on its own. It makes it look kind of empty. Although Tiki did, did a pretty, do a pretty good job of pulling off these areas. I mean, this doesn't exactly look empty or boring per se. It just is very minimalist which you may or may not like. Now this guy turning is another thing that I believe I added. Or, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did, or at least I kind of adjusted it a little bit. I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't always face the carpet because that would make it pretty much impossible to sneak by here. But we did a little bit of experimenting with what directions he would turn and exactly how long he should be doing that. It's kind of funny since this is supposed to be a modern time yet you're still using arrows and bows. Now his movement here is definitely something I recall putting in myself. This ties into one of the readables that we may or may not have seen yet. Which mentions that he tends to go off and get a drink. Well that's exactly what he's doing right here. And I follow him to just show off what that animation looks like. It would be very tough to move quickly in these areas because some of those spots have are more lit than they appear to be and there's really not much you can do about that because you set lights in the game and then you have the game calculate where those lights cast shadows but you really have no direct control over whether a place that's dark shows up as lit or not on your light gym and vice versa here's a little bit of advanced scripting that i'm not sure i know how to do offhand anymore which is, see how he speeds up that motion where he seems to take a drink of that martini? There you go. In order to do that, all the, all the AI in the game can have a property set called Time Warp. <laughs> and what it does is it speeds up or slows down their animation. So in this case, I gave him a property that sped up his animation for that for that little bit there and then it took off the property when he set the glass down and now he's back to normal and he's going back to where he was 
but I just cut to where I was before because I because the whole idea of doing that aside from adding a little bit of life to the scene by making things happen the idea was that it would make it easier to get out of this office because once you've snuck into this office it can be kind of tough to see where he is without getting yourself seen and I just figured that after sneaking by him once, it'd be a good idea not to have to sneak by him completely again. It's tough enough with that with the guard in the middle of that large in the middle of the large marble room trying to see you from different directions as he turns this way and that. And there's the old quarter zombie band. I still don't quite know what he was trying to do with it, with all this. And you can very much tell that we're from different countries because he spells his stuff with U's and I'm very American, so I don't. <laughs> and he also upstairs, there's a written note where he calls it maths instead of mathematics. Just, just little differences like that that kind of create a pretty big difference in how we build our, our stuff. And maybe it really stands out to the people who are playing. I, I don't know. I haven't really heard any responses about how, what people thought of this since it came out, but well, that's fine. <laughs> Here I'm a little frustrated because all, every, all this stuff is random, at least his turning is, and it's not meant to be synced up with her movement, so they can very much pin you in with the directions they're facing, and it's pretty much random whether or not they do. So now, This is another area where an AI will turn a light on and off. And it's just the same as before, actually pressing a button that turns it off, turns it off and then on and then off, on and then off. It's <laughs> kind of a lot of crazy stuff goes on behind the scenes, which kind of makes it exciting. It's not nearly so much here as it is later on when you get to my part of the mission because, well, in my part of the mission you've got maybe two or three AI, which are in a hidden room that you can't f ever get to because it's completely disconnected from the map. And basically they play the part of um, kind of stagehand, so to speak. They push buttons and do stuff behind the scenes that make all the pseudo scripting work. <laughs> and it's just kind of neat to think that there's little AI standing off in a room somewhere pushing buttons while you're experiencing all these little triggered events and you're thinking, whoa, this is so amazing. <laughs> Not even realizing that it's just some AI in a room pushing buttons. <laughs> now we had a lot of issues getting the lighting from the, the sun to always work correctly. I was on a kind of crappy laptop at the time and I'm not sure if Tiki's rig was any better but for me, Dromed would tend to hang and even crash when it was when I was doing a full rendering because it just couldn't handle rendering all that sunlight. And eventually someone, I, I'm afraid I can't remember who, but well, someone was generous enough to come along and help us and pointed out that we didn't have the grid snapped. Now, when I made my area, I made sure to use a grid snap, but when Tiki made his, that is this area here, he evidently didn't use a grid. So the problem is that if you make a whole mission without a grid, then Dromed tries to split the difference when it's rendering polygons and stuff. So there tends to be a lot more polygons than there otherwise should be. In addition to that, uh, with the lighting calculations and the movement calculations, especially the lighting, it really can get confused. And see note how these carpets actually stand up a little bit. It's because he's using a very, very fine grid setting. And that can cause troubles with both the polygons when it's being rendered and the lighting and the AI movement and all that stuff. But we were lucky enough that it seemed to turn out okay. It's probably part of the reason why some of those scripted events didn't quite work correctly though. Personally, when I do rugs, I tend to try and make them flat on the ground. But giving them a little bit of height like that does add something in the sense you can, you know, it seems like it had a little bit of depth and that kind of adds something, I guess. But in the end, it's just best not to mess with the crotchety lady drama and just do it the way that she likes. Here's some more little hidden coins. I actually really like how he made that bed with a little rise for the 
before the headrest. I tend to excessively use objects when I make missions and stuff, which is kind of too bad, because there's something to be said for a creative use of brushes for creating different objects, whether it's like a big table or a bed like that. It adds some some very well-needed variety, but uh, I just can't get myself over using objects instead. Which is fine if you've got a, a good variety of objects and they look great, but that's not always the case. And everyone's seen the Thief 2 objects of so many times, like thousands of times, and I'm sure that most of them are sick of them, unless they're just very patient. The Thief 2 community is just amazingly patient <laughs> with its uh, like this mission builders, and forgives a lot of little mistakes that otherwise you, you think I'll they probably find wouldn't. You. I'll find you. Don't worry, I don't quite get caught here. Well, actually, I technically do, but through the magic of editing, you probably don't notice that I did. Now, I believe Tiki made some new skins for this. At the time, I wasn't doing any editing at all with objects or models or, or anything. So I didn't know how to make skins. I think I had experimented with it once, but I didn't have the confidence to actually bring them into the game. Well, you notice that all these AI here kind of have the same uniform going on. And I believe that's because he created all these skins himself. I could be mistaken on that, though. And we're coming up to the part in just a bit where I begin to contribute. There's, there'll be another cut again where I realize that I came up to this point and I'd forgotten the key to get into the main bedroom there, which was, which was the one down in that pool area we saw before. So I had to run all the way down there and get it again and then come back up, which, trust me, was a little annoying when you have to go all the, over all these marble areas. I suppose that's kind of the downside of such a tight mission that has all those marble floors and all that kind of stuff because if an AI hears you then they all tend to hear you then they're after you forever and if they hit the third level of alertness then all of a sudden you lose. I'm not sure what those two textures there are supposed to be with the numbers and stuff. I've, no, I've never seen them before anywhere else but, but here. Maybe there's some un infrequently used texture but I'm really not sure what they're supposed to be. And there is the word maths. Yeah. And that room right there is our destination. That's where my contributions came in. Oh, I, I guess I didn't edit out that that moment of getting caught. Oh well. Now, this is basically where the mission ended when Tiki first gave me the game. He, sh he uh... Would have the mask in the chest there, and you'd grab it, and then you'd have to get back out to the little storage room off of the pool area, and that was the end of the game. Fairly short and very difficult, but this is where I hopped in. Actually, he showed me a texture for a phantom that's going to appear just now. He had an AI for it, and he, he asked me, he says, I want to put this in. What can we do with this? <laughs> And just based on that creature and, and the, the one AI and the name Tribal Breeze, I got this wacky idea for what we could do. And then I basically stole the mission away from him for three to four months. And when I handed it back, it was hugely different. And I assume he was pleased. I don't know. In a way, I feel kind of bad because right up here is the big twist because there really is nothing hinting at it coming about. That's just because we didn't really collaborate to that degree. We we kind of put stuff here and there. But I, did, I tried not to really modify his stuff too much, and I don't think he modified my stuff at all. So I didn't put any readables with hints in his stuff, and uh, there's just really nothing hinting at it. So I guess that makes it a huge twist, and in reality, it's just kind of a sloppy throw together. But I guess it all depends on how you look at it, right? Here's some readables, and I tend to try to keep my readables down to a page or two, personally. Just because I tend to get bored if I read too much, and some FM authors have huge, huge pages, just tons of them. I don't know. Here I'm pointing out that, this, notice the mask there, it's loot. And then notice that there's that necklace there, or amulet, whatever. It's also loot. I point this out because I actually put a bit of effort in this, I'm pretty proud of it. Okay, so we're taking one, 
Okay, now let's move on and do the big thing. I guess I'm pointing out that the lock locked backwards, whatever. Boom. And that's the AI he showed to me and wanted to do something with. I think it's that that mask with the mouth on all. And see, there. All of a sudden, you're in a completely different area. And note that the, the amulet is here, but the mask isn't. I set it up so that if you take the mask or the amulet, it'll delete it from this version. And I, it may or may not screw up the loot goal. In fact, I'm, it probably really does screw up the loot goal, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. I was just kind of proud of the cool effect that it remembered whether or not you had gathered the particular piece of loot or not. <laughs> Whatever. Now, that pretty smooth effect was done because I copied the room and basically moved it up like a thousand units or something. Probably more like 500, I guess. And then... After that, I built this whole area completely around that one room inside the tree. <laughs> now, this was inspired by some kind of test mission I'd seen at the time. I believe it was by Nameless Voice. He demonstrated how you can use uh, sources and receptrons. Is that how you pronounce it? Receptrons? You can use them to uh, basically seamlessly teleport the player to another part of the map, but if the part looks exactly the same and if it's aligned just right, it'll basically you won't be able to tell that you moved at all, and it'll look like everything around you suddenly changed, which is a really cool effect, and I tried to do it again later on with my Lingering Whispers game. There was a moment in there where you do a teleport, but I just couldn't get it to work right, or maybe I was just lazy. But it just didn't quite work right, and I didn't rem remember how I'd gotten it to work, so I just skipped it, basically. I went for a classic old teleport trap. That's a script on a marker, where if you activate it, it can teleport the player to its location. Or whatever it's attached to, basically. Now, with all these areas, are completely made by me just faffing about, basically. I added these things like the eight beasts and this whole treehouse bit here. Mostly just because I was like, eh, what am I going to do? Most of these areas had very little revision. That is to say, I just kind of built until it looked decent and then I moved on. I was lucky enough that there wasn't too much trouble with too many polygons or anything. And I'm still kind of proud with how some of it turned out. I think it looks kind of creative in a way. And it is, I suppose, it's just very chaotic because I was just pulling stuff out of my butt, basically. Sometimes I wish I could go back to the way I thought of things back at this point when I made this. Because since I built this, things seem a bit more complicated, even though I know more about it. And sometimes I tend to overlook the simple stuff, like the like making interesting looking levels or maybe it's just because I when I'm trying to build areas that look like they're uh, man-made it just turns out kind of sloppy because my method is very organic which works well for these organic areas like the like the forest or the strange buildings carved out of the forest but in actually making human-made buildings, it tends to make stuff look a little cobbled together. At least I feel that was kind of an issue with Lingering Whispers, personally. Now, in this area here, I had initially wanted there to be the player going down on the ground, because I think I was frequently looking at the way it was built in the tra um, I almost said Trail of Tears, no. In the Tracing the Courier mission. I looked at that frequently for kind of some ideas and how I do this or that, the other thing. And that's kind of, I suppose, where the hollow trees bit came from in the first place. Don't worry, I don't get caught here, miraculously. Maybe it's because he's like stuck against those steps and he doesn't quite get close enough to touch me. <laughs> I, I can't believe I did that move. <laughs> I, I put a skull inside a, <laughs> a chest. What a dick move. And it worked against me. <laughs> Uh, 
Anyway, I, I had initially intended the player to be able to go on the ground, but I think that at that point I was having some trouble having the polygons be too much. Like there were too many trees and strange shapes around, and I tended to go for some kind of crazy roots and that kind of thing, so it just made a huge mess when optimizing, and it was just, it was just crazy. So I s s just stuck to these two levels inside the trees. You'll see the other level a bit later because I kind of have to go around to avoid these two little dolts here. But it did the job okay, I suppose. There are plenty of other areas where we were outside of the forest and get a kind of a glimpse at its size and scope. In a lot of ways, I suppose I learned how to do things like hinting at areas that you can get to later or having a peek at something you have to kind of go a long ways to get back to. See, like I looked out of the little slit windows in that one area. Now I have to walk all the way around to get to them. Some may find that kind of annoying, but uh, in a lot of ways I think it's kind of a good thing. You know, it's satisfying when you see something beforehand and then are able to get to it. Now as for these crazy portals in the trees, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. And there, there's a sloppy effort of me trying to make roots. I really should have used objects for that, but at the time I had no clue how to make objects, and I'm only really kind of learning just now, in fact. But those are completely brushes, just like everything else. So the game would often throw a fit when I was trying to build them into the engine, because since there's so many strange shapes that are being rotated and skewed in odd ways, it was just really awkward for it to try to optimize it. I guess it would get confused because there'd be strange intersections between the polygons or something or another. And I had to go through actually a bit of work to get those little bits of roots right there to work correctly. I don't remember ever being stuck in that area before, otherwise I probably would have done something to try and fix that. And that rock with the vines over that I just jumped over, that rock's like hollow and if you look closely there's like a little slit in it. Because if an object like those vines, ha uh, if the center of it is inside of a brush, the whole object will just disappear and it won't do anything inside the engine. So uh, it has to be within an airbrush, but for more than just that, I found it also has to be connected to the airbrush that it's in. Or at least it was in that case. So I couldn't just have the rock be hollow in an area you couldn't get to anyway. It had to have a little slit for the object to show, so it's kind of a weird little building exercise right there. Notice that if, if you look at the side there, it doesn't look like you're picking up an 8 beast. It kind of looks like you're picking up a hammerhead or something. Not quite sure what that is. I also kind of like how the little altar turned out and I worked, I worked a little bit to try and put some contrast into this with the black and the kind of reddish sequoia style textures. They really don't have a lot to work with when it comes to Thief though, because the stock resources, while there's a lot of them, you kind of have to use your imagination, both when building and playing, unless you're just a god and you're able to make everything completely perfect from the get-go like a lot of FM authors are. but. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them, so I have to kind of go with what I can find. I actually built this area here speci specifically for this reason, because I knew that I'd have the 8 beast patrolling right through here, so I have a little nook right here you can duck into. I think it took a little work for me to work out exactly how their patrol should be moving. But in the end, I'm pretty satisfied with how it turned out. And I just kind of get rid of a mirror. <laughs> that brownish area down there would have been an area you could get to, but I just decided against it. And there's nothing under the stairs here. I'm just checking. I actually don't find a lot of loot that I put in there, just because I don't remember where it all is, really. I did a little load there. That's why there was a jump. And this a this uh, tree beast here isn't real, so don't worry about it. I put him in there just kind of as a teaser for for later on. For some reason, when I did this playtest, this uh, gravestone right here has 
just a solid white texture. I have no clue why that is. I'm not sure if that's like a bug in the engine or if it's a bug in this particular FM. I don't know. I've, I've never seen that before. I know that it had a texture when I made it. Oh, well, the good thing is just a gravestone and nothing too much more than that. Otherwise, it may have really looked weird. I was actually kind of proud of that poem, but I just realized <laughs> that I used the wrong form of two, which is pretty embarrassing. Because this is the final release after testing all that stuff and, you know, hundreds of people have played this. At least I assume they have. Hundreds of people have downloaded it anyway. So everyone knows that I used the wrong version of 2 there, which is pretty embarrassing. Those eye things are pretty cool. I just wish that they were a little more useful. These crystal caves I, I had a lot of fun with, although it took a lot of work to rebuild them. The reason why they're so claustrophobic right here is just because of, again, polygon counts. Initially, this was a really big, open, cavernous area. What with, uh, with where these ancient steps are and that little bit of stuff behind the zombie there and this broken down bridge. This had been a huge open cavern but I really had to change that simply because I couldn't show too much of it at once or else the game would crash. But in the end I think that's better for the fact that I tightened everything up like this. The Thief engine really works a lot better, the Dark engine that is, if you can't see too much at once. Because if you can see too much, then it kind of spoils it. Because it just doesn't have a lot of variety. There's a lot of the same texture repeated all over the place. And the lighting effects, well, nice for sneaking because they're very black and white, so to speak. Like, there's a lot of areas where it can be very bright here and then very dark right next to it, which is completely contrary to how things look in real life, of course. Um, while that's nice for the sneaking mechanics, it really kind of hurts the aesthetic of things. But if you're careful, and if you have the, the color settings or light settings done right, it can be less of an issue. I know that a lot of FM authors make very nice large areas that don't look crappy, but I'm still learning how to do that even now. Now I was proud to hear that a lot of folks think that this is one of the best temple areas and one of the best jungle areas that they've ever played. Now mind you this is back in 2009 I believe. Maybe it was 2010 but I think it was 2009. So there may have been pretty significant changes back then. I know that Tracing the Courier 2 has come out since then, which did an amazing job with its forest areas. I'm actually kind of jealous. But at the time, I was really proud of how this temple thing turned out. It was basically just me wanting to make kind of a ruined area. And then I found these nice objects with the bricks. So I was like, oh, I'll have some bricks laying around. And that's kind of cool. And then I found the textures with these uh, colored bits and the whole elemental thing. And that's how I got the idea for the ele elemental jujus. It was entirely inspired by the textures, basically. That and my finding of the objects that were the talismans. At the time I played this, well, the time I built this, rather, I hadn't really played through Thief Gold. I had played through Thief 2 when I was younger, but I never really got to Thief Gold. So, I didn't actually know about what the talisman were meant for. I just found them and I was like, oh, I can do something with that. <laughs> Here's an old little side forest area that you can't get to, largely because I was running out of brushes at this point. After I'd built a certain degree of the level here, I found that I was quickly running out of resources, not to mention things were getting really complicated and time consuming. So. I wanted to kind of summarize things, so there are some areas that aren't as big as maybe they otherwise would have been. But I think that turned out for the best as well, because the size of things... It's big enough that people have gotten lost, like a lot of people. And I know based on the comments I've gotten on the threads for this. But I think it's big enough to really have a satisfying jungle feel to it. And yet, for those who have never played it before, never been in these areas before, they can have a little maze-like maze qualities, but once they, once they go through them a few times, they kind of get the gist of how things are supposed to be going. And that's kind of what I was going for, really. 
initially, I, I'm looking back here because initially there had been like a area high up in that tree, another kind of hollowed out house area, but I suppose I must have cut that at some point. And I really like how this tree turned out with the roots and stuff, but that's really sloppy to do with brushes. So in the future, if I do something like that, I'll have to try using an object and just kind of being creative with how it wraps around the brush. Now, I don't find a fraction of that loot that's actually in this mission. In fact, I'm pretty sure that no one ever has because after I finished building this mission, I was so tired of building, I basically didn't want to look back ever. <laughs> so I never went back to repair or check things out. I think someone tried to do a loot list once, but I just couldn't find all the loot. And I really didn't remember well enough or really care well enough, to be honest, to go back and try and find it and help them find it. But um, that's just kind of how it goes when you're working with an amateur like I was and still am, I suppose. In reality, there's probably a few pieces of loot that are outside of the bounds of some brush somewhere. So you actually can't grab them. <laughs> Maybe they're just in such a hard to find area that, or hard to reach, that it's just practically impossible to get to it. I went pretty crazy with putting little coins here and there and bits of crystal up in the tops of trees. I know a lot of people have had trouble finding this area right here where the water juju is. It's actually the easiest one to find, which is why I'm going for it first. I figured that having it kind of hidden there would be sufficient reason to make it easy to actually find once you got to it. And as always in Thief 2, you can't attack inside the water, so you're forced to confront this little spider. Thankfully, they've only got one unit of health, so anything hitting him basically kills him. And then there you go. It's got a little sound effect, which is intended to kind of point out where it is. Not sure how easy it necessarily is to find thanks to that, but that was the idea behind it anyway. There's a lot of objects crammed in here, like this big grayish thing to the left is an object. This big brownish one, well, darker gray one here, I suppose, is also an object. Mostly because at this point I was really running out of polygons, even in an area like this. So I wanted to simplify a bit by using some objects as is really pretty wise to do when you're working with the Thief 2 engine. Now a lot of people had trouble finding this area as well. Uh, even I don't find it right here. There's, there's a little nook here. But I'm looking for an area of the temple that's kind of collapsed and closed off. It's just around the corner to left up ahead once I get past this ape beast with a dynamic light in his hand. I was so proud of adding that. I felt like I was the man because you just don't see that in the original game. And it's not done a whole lot in FMs. Maybe it is now, I suppose. But at the time, it felt novel. Whether or not it actually was, I don't know. You may notice you don't actually see a lot of light in this mission. Well, my part of the mission, that is. That's because I actually didn't really like the whole daylight thing a whole lot. I much preferred to have things kind of dark with the cover and all that stuff. The heavy tree cover, as if you couldn't see. So that was kind of the idea. And here you get a little glimpse as to what's to come. There's the little thief down there. I know a lot of people had trouble finding this particular area. Because it's closed off over here with these big plants that hurt you if you touch them. And on this side, you've got this area that you have to basically go one direction, then turn around, and then slip in between some trees to find it. Now, you may have noticed there was a mask sitting on, the, uh, on that pedestal there. That's kind of a hint as to another pedestal that can be highlighted but has no mask on it. And in a bit here, we'll, we'll get the mask that's necessary for it. When I made this area, a lot of it was just done flying by the seat of my pants, so that's why there's not really much hint as to what you actually have to do. Um, I think some people find that kind of annoying, <laughs> and I suppose rightfully so. But, in a way, it's kind of satisfying for some folks anyway, when they are able to just fi figure things out completely on their own. 
I think I took it a little too far in some of my work in um, in Lingering Whispers. I probably could have had a little more hints in there. And I probably should have had some hints in this area too. Just because people here are like, oh, well, I was supposed to get a mask and all of a sudden I'm here and there's no objectives or anything that changed. Well, that's because, oh, look, he's holding his lantern up <laughs> kind of to the side. That's strange. Anyway, that's because I didn't know how to make objectives and I really didn't have the guts to give it a shot. So I just relied on readables and I kind of wanted to be sparse with readables because as I said, they kind of, excessive readables annoy me. So instead I kind of tried to show what happened, just imply it by the way things look and just hope that I kind of lead the player to what's necessary. So that's the case here too, he's got a big book and yet Everything he has to say is summarized on a single page, and I kind of appreciate that, personally. Hrag, I'm, I don't remember what that's from. It may be some kind of African god or something. I must have got that name from somewhere. I'm pretty sure I didn't just pull it out of my butt. Well, then maybe I did. Who knows? I'm still pretty pleased with how this area right here turned out. The contrasts between the reddish and the yellowish wood and just kind of the way everything is constructed it feels very tight to me the designs very very close and it just I don't know it just makes sense in a way in a way I can't quite explain it doesn't look boring to look at even though there's only two textures at play at least I personally think so others may think that I've got too much stuff going on in a small area that's something I really feel I need to work on as a FM maker I get really nervous if an area is large and doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. Even if it's kind of medium sized, it doesn't have a lot of stuff in it. So I tend to overpack areas with too much stuff. And then it's just crazy and difficult to navigate and... Eh, I don't know. Now, it's anyone's guess why the fire's still going when everyone's dead. Especially since everyone's clearly rotted away to a corpse. So I guess that the... <laughs> rotted away to a corpse. Rotted away to skeletons. So I guess the only explanation is that the ape beasts must have kept the fires roaring for some reason. There's a little bit of sadness right here with a poor little dead child hugging its doll. Still think that the whole scene set up there, as well as the one with the guy who's you saw earlier who was laying dead on the ground and has some arrows down around him. I think that all turned out pretty well. You hear the laughter of the mask, which probably unconsciously inspired me with the mask I as to the mask I chose for Lingering Whispers, because it's the exact same mask. I just love the masks in this game. I've always got a thing for really cool, creepy looking masks. A lot of people have trouble finding that air juju, but if you stand right here, it comes right to you, so... It even lights up. I suppose so do the Will of the Wisps, so it can be easily mistaken for one. Well, technically, it actually is a Will of the Wisp. I just changed the Wisp into a floating chest that's shaped like a air juju. And then when you grab it, then that's what you get. Now, this area here was completely built from that little branch you, you just saw me exiting from and it, as in the, that little area here with these four trees is actually right off of that tall tree that I just exited from so it, it actually is right there you're not actually being teleported in that case in these other three cases though you are being teleported somewhere and that's just a simple case of you touching the t touching those red areas and then it activates a trigger which teleports you to another one. I think I decided to do that because I figured that it was a little t tough to navigate around so I suppose adding a teleporting maze kind of thing does help speed things up once you learn where it takes you. Here you kind of encounter some of the tree beasts. There are I believe three no scratch I think that there are actually four real tree beasts here. That one over there on the right. This one over there on the left. 
I think that one behind you may actually be real as well. I may be mistaken on that though. And then there's one back there by the entrance. Right there. Who's also real. The rest is all just a tease for that. Now, some people made a comment that they had never seen the tree beast climb stairs before until they played this. I'm not sure where they got that from because I didn't have to do anything for it. They just climbed the stairs on their own. I didn't intend that or anything. It was just the way it was, so I just rolled with it, basically. And if you're quick like that, you can get away from them, no problem. And with that, I've got all the jujus. Well, actually, no I don't, do I? I still need to put down the mask and then get the fire juju, which is in a side area here. Again, the only hint to this was that there was that one mask sitting on the other pedestal. And I guess there is a mention in the dead father's notes there in his journal that, that he'd taken a mask from somewhere, and that's it. Now this area had been closed off. You may have noticed before that there was a spot that had... Because I fell down this hole earlier, and there was a spot right where I was standing a moment ago where there was actually a movable wall there. And then once you put in the mask, those walls move, allowing you to get up to where that fire juju is. I'm always a big fan of the player's progression opening and closing different doors and windows. So I, I like it when there are certain areas where you can move freely before, but then once you do something, those areas close and then another area opens, allowing you newer ways of moving from one place to another. That really keeps areas interesting, especially since in Thief 2, areas are supposed to have a lot of replayability. So there should be kind of an interesting aspect about them that makes them fun to be in more than once. At least that's the idea. And with that, now I have all the jujus. There were a lot of questions when I first played this game, and well, when I first made this game, about whether or not there was something special that happened if you put in all the jujus, all four of them. Now when I was designing this and building it, I thought, well, I understand maybe someone wanted to completely sneak through and so maybe they didn't want to go for the for the Earth Juju because you got to confront the tree beasts. So I figured that I'd have it so that the opposing elements, that is fire and water or air and earth, when put together, would open their own doors just like this. And there's uh, those two doors on each side, so either case, they wind up to the same place, which is, in hindsight, if I'd have known more about scripting and if I'd have thought about it, I probably would have tried to do something to make it worthwhile getting all four of them. But as it stands, you can get one or the other, or all four, it doesn't really make a difference except for feeling you've, like you've completed it. And in reality, you can't really complete it because there's just there isn't any loot lists, and no one really knows where all the loot is, so... Who can really say? In fact, a lot of it may be a bug, now that I think about it, that you can't get all the loot. There's probably some loot mentioned that isn't... that gets deleted somewhere, or that just doesn't exist quite as it should. I haven't really collaborated with Tiki or talked to him since I made this, so I'm not exactly sure where he is these days or what he's been doing. I was still really proud with the effect I had there of putting those talisman in and then having things light up. And then this whole area is a little clumsy because I was working in kind of constricted space trying to do something with what I had here. And then in the end I just came up with these stairs that are kind of mirrored on the other side. So you come up to this place and you've got these two stones which inexplicably have an elevator. Don't, don't question it. <laughs> And then the other stairs go down to the exact same place, and it's just a mirror of the other side, basically. I'm just pointing that out right here. So we're finally almost done. There's one more of the stuff that I built. 
which is the crypt down at the very bottom. And at this point, I was really, really running low on resources, so it was necessary to kind of keep things simple, stupid. That's why this area here is so tiny compared to everything else. I want it to be kind of a final confrontation, but that's difficult to do in Thief because you're very limited on what AI can really do. Unless you're maybe some kind of expert programmer, maybe you could add new functionality to the AI, or if you're just really creative, you can make them seem like they can do things that they've never done before. But in reality, the AI are very set in stone. So you've got like your guys with swords, and no matter what they look like, they're still guys with swords. It doesn't matter if they actually have swords or if they have just bare hands. And then similarly, you've got the guys with hammers, which basically are the exact same thing as the guys with swords. You just swing it a little bit differently. And then you've got your archers, which can either shoot arrows or some other projectile. And then you've got your spellcasters. And actually, spellcasters and archers work the exact same way as far as the game is concerned. Both of them kind of magically have an object appear at their hands. It's just that one of them happens to have arrows appear. And the other one happens to have something else, like a magic projectile appear. It's funny, I expected him to be a tough little boss, but in reality, you just kill him just like that. At least you probably can't knock him out. So uh, at least I covered up that potential mistake. Here I'm just looking around for one more piece of loot that I'm sure is around here somewhere. Now you can do some playing around with like sources and receptrons and just different little scripts and stuff to make it seem like AI can do more than just those two things basically you've got your melee and you've got your spellcasters and that's about it and they all move basically the same you've got some that are humans and some that are monsters and that's basically all you've got so it's just a matter of whether or not you can do something creative with that now here there's kind of a clumsy transition up that elevator because I found that I couldn't do a smooth one because you'd fall down the elevator shaft you wouldn't quite appear exactly where you should be, so I kind of had to teleport you a little bit higher than you otherwise would have been. That's why there's a brief jerk there, but on your way back, as you saw, this is basically a completely smooth transition again. Here I'm trying out some of my weaponry, but I find it doesn't work so well. I like gas arrow was able to knock him out without causing any trouble. Hey, but my attempt with the blackjack here oh, was a little no. less than successful. She's just a little jerk there and... Well, I lose. <laughs> I don't even bother with the gas arrow this time, I don't think. Now, the way that it works when an AI is alerted to your presence, basically all the AI can have a single response programmed in. Only one, unfortunately. I wish that there could have they could have multiple because then they could do so much more, but basically they're limited to just one. And in this case, their one response to being knocked out is to push a button, and that button signals the end of the mission. And I made a mistake of quick saving right here, and I reload just to find that the AI doesn't move anymore. So there's a little bug that I guess we never had ironed out. I'm not sure how I even would iron it out. Thankfully, I've got the secret passage that I added to this mission over here. Show yourself. No skulking. <sighs> it's always strange when people try to make missions that aren't meant to be Garrett, and yet Garrett still sounds like Garrett. I understand that it's a lot of work to replace all those sounds, I probably wouldn't bother myself. But it's still something that kind of stands out in my mind. It's a little odd. It's too bad that it's not easier to replace all those sounds. I once looked into it, but the problem is that all those sounds of when Garrett gets hit, like if he's hit by a sword and you hear kind of a crunch and he gives a uh, kind of grunt or something, the sound file includes the crunch and the grunt, so the crunch isn't separate, isn't a separate sound file. So you basically have to very carefully replace the grunt without over without replacing the crunching sound. But oftentimes they overlap. So it's kind of a crunch and then a grunt just partway through the crunch. 
you don't really notice it when you're just playing, but when you're trying to edit the sound files, it's very annoying. And then we need to get over there to that final spot to the left, Strange which way. is the storage area. I have no clue how the, the player character is supposed to get out once you get to that point, but nevertheless, that's complete objectives, and we are done. Now, once again, this has been Scary Kitties. I've been doing a developer commentary for Tribal Breeze. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Bye.